Chapter Twenty One of the Life and Adventures of Michael Armstrong, the Factory Boy. This is a LibriVox recording. Chapter Twenty One. Miss Brotherton exerts her eloquence, and Nurse Tremlett is brought to reason thereby. The heiress hardens her heart and speaks harsh truth to Martha Dowling, but all in vain. She conceives a project and sets about putting it in execution with great spirit. Well, my dear Mary said mrs tremlett on sitting down tete-a-tete -tete with miss brotherton after their return from fairly don't you think that you will come at last to confess that i was right when i told you that you had better let things alone and not attempt to make any fuss or stir about these factory goings-on mary looked sick at heart and only shook her head in reply why what have you gained my dear child by all your labour and pains to get information as you call it you are looking as white as a sheet your eyes are sunk in your head when i look at you instead of the smiles you used to give me i get nothing but sighs and all for what can you in honesty and truth say that you have gained anything worth knowing by following your own opinion instead of mine what good in the world can you do dear by listening to all the shocking stories that clergyman there told you i dare say he is a very good man and he looks like it but upon my word i think he is doing nothing but just wasting his time as well as yourself for though i sat and said nothing as of course it was my place to do i listened to every word and it is just because i believe every word was true that common sense makes me see there's no good to talk about it indeed and indeed my darling i would not make free to talk to you in this way which looks for all the world as if i was taking advantage of your goodness to me if i did not see that you was going the way to torment yourself for everlasting without doing one bit of good to any one for how my dear can you or that good clergyman either hope to put down all the wicked doings he told about and to be sure he said as much himself didn't he miss mary then do make up your mind to be quiet and happy and let things that you can't mend alone put as many children to school as you like my dear and you may give them a pretty neat uniform you know and that will be a pleasure for you to think about and to look at but for pity's sake my dear dear child give up at once and for ever this bothering yourself for everlasting about the factories which you can no more stop mary than you can stop the sun from rising in the morning and setting at night here the good woman ceased and looked with some anxiety in the thoughtful eyes of her young mistress she felt that she did not understand their expression and no wonder for mary brotherton herself sat silently doubting how she should answer her a languid feeling proceeding partly from fatigue and indisposition and partly from the discouraging conviction that she had no very satisfactory arguments by which to rebut her old friend's charge of useless devotion to a hopeless cause made her some minutes unwilling to speak at all then came a somewhat peevish wish to interdict for ever the discussion of the subject between them but as she raised her eyes to utter it she encountered a look of such humble love deprecating her displeasure yet fondly clinging to the freedom which risked the incurring it that her purpose suddenly changed and instead of the chilling command she was meditating she threw her arms round the old woman's neck exclaiming oh my dear nurse how much how very much you must love me since care for my already too much cared for peace and quiet can harden such a heart as yours towards all the sufferings we have this day heard recounted thank god you are not angry cried the affectionate old woman kissing her and then arranging the neglected ringlets of her pretty charge and looking cheerily in her face she said now then mary i won't tease you any more about it you are so sweet and so gentle to me that i am quite sure you will not long think my heart is hard and then by degrees you will find out that i am right and then all will go well again and i shall see my dear girl look like herself once more nurse tremlett the time is already come when the impossibility of my efforts being of any avail to stem the torrent with which avarice and cruelty are overwhelming the land is made evident to me so much dear nurse i concede to you and therefore on that point we will argue no more but my dear old woman have patience with me if i tell you that there are some points on which my reading may have given me young as i am as much or even more information than your experience has given you you have heard of the slave trade nurse tremlett you have heard more than one excellent charity sermon preached in aid of the funds that were to assist in freeing these poor helpless black people from the tyranny of their masters 
and i suppose you know that it is now unlawful to buy and sell these poor creatures and how do you think this happy change in their favour has been brought about by the king and the parliament miss mary making that most good and righteous law replied nurse tremlett and how were they persuaded to make that law think you demanded mary i can't tell how that was brought about my dear i suppose it was because they saw that it was right and fit it was brought about nurse tremlett by the voices of the people of england which were for years raised quietly and with no breach of law or order but with patient and unshrinking perseverance against this great sin till the lengthened cry could be no longer resisted and the law they perseveringly asked for was granted to them do you think nurse tremlett that if during these years of orderly but steady remonstrance every englishman and woman had acted upon the principle you recommend and had turned their thoughts and their conversation from the subject of negro slavery because each one knew that he or she individually possessed no power to stop it do you think that if such had been the system acted upon england would now have to boast of having abolished this most wicked traffic perhaps not my dear i think i understand you now replied the honest-hearted old woman eagerly then now my dear old friend we shall i think never have any more disputes upon this subject you i every servant in my house every acquaintance i have in the world may aid and assist in putting an end to this most atrocious factory system which ought to weigh heavier upon every christian english heart than ever the slave trade did if the whole british empire nurse did but know what we were about here if the facts we heard from mr bell to-day were but impressed upon the minds of all my fellow-subjects as they are on mine the horrors he detailed would cease before another year was come and gone god forbid then my sweet child that i should ever more raise my sinful voice to drown your righteous one i have been a vain self-sufficient old woman my dear mary and clearly have been talking a great deal about that of which i know nothing only don't think i am cruel and hard-hearted for though i do as you truly say though i do love you very much indeed i am not such a wretch as to hear all we were told to-day without wishing to mend it this was the last time mary brotherton had to do battle with her nurse on the subject of the factory system once awakened to the sense of its tyranny and injustice and made to feel that the only hope of remedy lay in the possibility of universally raising british feeling against it there was no danger that the right-hearted old woman would ever again turn with indifference weariness or displeasure from the theme her young mistress felt that she had touched the right string and that she should never again have to fear discord where it was so essential to her comfort to find harmony this change was really a comfort and she felt it to be so removing as it did one irksome feature from her situation and for a few minutes it cheered her and she said so cordially but the next a pang shot to her heart as she remembered that this assurance of accordant counsels with her venerable nurse could avail her nothing in the most painful of all her difficulties for it promised no help either in obtaining light upon the mystery of poor michael's abode or in the still more pressing embarrassment of confessing to his unhappy mother and brother the impossibility of obtaining it yet this painful task must be performed and that without delay for well she knew that every hour that passed without their seeing her would be rendered dreadful both by the agony of fear and the sickening hot and cold fits of uncertainty but never had she felt herself so very a coward as while meditating this visit of the morrow she saw in imagination the eager questioning of edward's speaking eyes and the heavy glance of his mother anticipating the worst she had to tell sometimes she thought she would await the coming of the boy to take his place in the school and let him report the failure of all her inquiries to the poor widow but there was a selfish cowardice in this which instantly struck her and she seemed to hate herself for the suggestion for above an hour after she had laid her head upon her pillow these thoughts kept her painfully awake and it was only after deciding that she would once more see martha dowling and try the effect of repeating to her but without quoting her authority the dark hints she had listened to respecting sir matthew's possible motives it was only when her restless thoughts had fixed themselves on this that she at length closed her aching eyes in sleep above an hour before the usual hour of rising mary brotherton was already at her writing-desk the idea of going to dowling lodge and encountering the knight and his family was intolerable and she had therefore recourse to her pen as the means of obtaining the interview she wished for without paying for it the penalty of such a visit she wrote as follows 
my dear miss martha i trust you are too good-natured to be angry with me even if you should think that i am taking a great liberty with you but the truth is that i much wish for the pleasure of seeing you and yet am too idle this morning to venture upon a drive will you then have the great kindness to pass the morning with me here i send my carriage lest lady dowling should not have one at leisure to send with you believe me my dear miss martha yours very sincerely mary brotherton having written folded and sealed this epistle mary recollected that it would be impossible to send it for at least four hours and she smiled first and then sighed as she thought of the restless but useless activity which had caused her so needlessly to forestall her usual hour of rising it would in truth have been better for her poor girl could she have slept through the time for her waking thoughts had little that was pleasant to rest upon even the commencement of edward's studies to which she had before looked forward with great delight now recurred to her only to bring the recollection that if she saw him his thoughts would be neither of his new clothes nor his new books but of michael and of her promise to get tidings of him for his sake and for her own too she determined at least to escape this interview feeling that it would be better for all parties that no tidings should be delivered to both mother and son at once which could be done after his school hours by her driving to hoxley lane after she had taken martha home in pursuance of this resolution she walked to the schoolhouse renewed her orders that the greatest attention should be paid to the new scholar edward armstrong and care taken that if he were found backward for his age he should neither be laughed at nor chide she then left a message for him stating that she should be engaged all the morning but would see him at his mother's house after he left school at eleven o'clock miss brotherton's equipage set off for dowling lodge bearing her letter to martha and the interval till its return was an anxious one first she felt doubtful if her unusual invitation would be accepted and if it were she felt more doubtful still as to the nature of the scene which must follow nothing short of her earnest wish to redeem her promise to mrs armstrong could have given mary courage to do what she now meditated she entertained not the slightest doubt of the intrinsic excellence of martha dowling all she had ever seen of her and still more all she had heard from the armstrongs convinced her of this and to pain her therefore particularly in that most tender point the exposure of her father the tremendous effect of which upon her mary had already witnessed was one of the very last measures she could have been led to adopt but a strong and stern feeling of justice urged her not to shrink from this it was evident from the statement of mrs armstrong that martha had been actively instrumental in sending michael to his present destination let it be where it might and painful or not painful it was unquestionably right to make her understand the doubts that existed as to the boy's well-being in order that she might avail herself as she was bound to do of her access to the only person who could explain the transaction having screwed her courage therefore to the strictness of examination necessary to her most righteous purpose mary left her boudoir in the possession of mrs tremlett and repaired to the library to await her guest nor did she wait long almost before the time arrived at which she had calculated that the carriage might return the great house bell gave signal of a visitor and the next moment martha dowling stood before her the two young girls shook hands and each observed that the other looked paler than she was wont to do the heart of mary sank within her as she marked the expression of martha's countenance not only was it pale but most speakingly anxious and in addition to her usual shy and reserved manner there was an appearance of uneasiness and almost a fear as she thought which seemed to tell her that her object was suspected nor was she wrong in pursuance of a promise given to michael martha had visited the widow armstrong and the intense anxiety under which she found her suffering respecting the destination of her boy awakened for the first time in her own mind a shadowy suspicion that all might not be right concerning him the pang this cost her was terrible good and kind-hearted as she was there was no strength of fibre in martha's character which might enable her to brave everything rather than remain in doubt she loved her father fondly but she feared him more and the stronger her suspicions grew and unhappily the more she meditated the more they strengthened the less power she felt either to refute or confirm them the note of miss brotherton was delivered to her at the family breakfast-table and the instant she read it the truth suggested itself to her mind had she been a free agent the wounded shrinking spirit of the poor girl would have certainly led her to invent some excuse for refusing an invitation so full of terror but she was not what's that about martha 
said sir matthew holding out his hand for the note it is from miss brotherton muttered martha as she resigned it to him mercy on me exclaimed her eldest sister what a wonderful fancy miss brotherton seems to have taken for martha i do think it is the very oddest thing i ever heard of what a goose you are my dear not to understand it observed miss harriet the second sister giving at the same time a very significant glance towards her brother augustus but good gracious retorted miss arabella why might not any other of us do as well it would seem so much more natural in such an elegant and fashionable girl as she is she is afraid of us bella replied miss harriet tittering sir matthew who had not only read the note but contrived to hear all that his two eldest daughters said concerning it here burst into a laugh said a thief to catch a thief hey harriet come martha start away you have finished your breakfast long ago i won't have the carriage kept waiting must i go papa said poor martha turning very pale must you go and with that die away look too why martha are you jealous because some folks fancy that the young lady wants to make friends with you for more reasons than one i would a great deal rather not go papa replied martha in a beseeching accent martha i shall be in a downright passion with you in half a minute upon my honour i never heard anything so cross-grained and unsisterly in my life go this moment and get on your bonnet and remember if you please from first to last to speak of your brother as a sister ought to speak and if she hints anything about his having flirted a little with carrie thompson be sure to say that he only did it to laugh at her as he spoke these words sir matthew rose from the table as if to accelerate the movement which was to send her off martha listened to him with the habitual reverence which she ever bestowed on all he uttered but shook her head as it seemed involuntarily as he concluded why you don't mean to say he was in earnest you good-for-nothing spiteful girl cried lady dowling suddenly rousing herself from the dignified apathy in which she usually indulged what a shame cried one sister that's too bad cried the other just like her though sneered mr augustus hold your tongues all of you said sir matthew i know martha better than any of ye trust me for that and what i bid her do that she will do and nothing else run away martha don't mind any of em thus urged thus goaded to the interview she dreaded martha hastened to leave the room but ere she passed the door something at her heart told her that her best course would be to take her father apart and tell him all she turned back to look at him but met a frown so strongly indicative of growing impatience at her delay that yielding to the sort of slavish feeling in which she had been nurtured she hurried forward to obey him had she possessed greater moral courage many subsequent events would have been different after the first salutation was over miss brotherton making a strong mental effort to subdue her agitation of which she was infinitely more capable than her companion begged her to sit down and then placing herself where she could have as a commentary on what she might induce her to say the advantage of watching her countenance she pronounced in a voice that she in vain laboured to render steady my dear miss martha i have suffered a great deal of uneasiness since i last saw you respecting the little boy for whom concerning whom i mean michael armstrong martha his mother is very wretched because she cannot discover to what place he has been sent and i nothing doubting that it would be perfectly easy to learn this from you rashly promised that i would obtain this information can you dear girl tell me more upon this subject now than you could when last we met i cannot miss brotherton replied martha dowling in a voice so low and husky as hardly to be audible but with a complexion and features that spoke so plainly what was passing in her heart that mary felt ashamed of having placed herself where she could so distinctly read all she suffered and leaving her chair to share the sofa on which the poor girl was seated she took her hand and said my poor dear martha it would be better for us both that i should speak sincerely i have become acquainted with an individual martha who knows more much more than either you or i can do my dear girl respecting the factories those great magazines of human life and labour by which your father and mine also have grown from poverty to wealth this person martha on my questioning him respecting the probable destination of a child so circumstanced did not scruple to reply that if his master were displeased and wished to be rid of him there were places factories mills dear martha where the business was so managed as to render labour very heavy punishment and where it was easy to keep children ay hundreds of them unseen and unknown for years 
do not tremble thus dear martha do not draw your hand away from me most sure i am that your heart and my heart must beat in sympathy on such a subject as this let us be mutually sincere and we may help each other to undo whatever wrong may have been done we know we both well know that your father was displeased with this poor widow's son we know too that he is a person of great power and influence the boy is gone he will not tell us where what is the inference turn not from it martha dowling turn not from it my poor friend but boldly and honestly seek out the truth and let me know enough of it to save this helpless child from further suffering i have no means miss brotherton faltered poor martha if all your dreadful thoughts were true which you have no right to think they are and still less have i but if they were true all true i have no means to know it if you have any reason to believe them true said mary solemnly means must be taken martha dowling to stop further wrong and this can only be by learning where michael armstrong has been sent i apply to you for this with great reluctance because i know the subject cannot be brought before you without causing pain but i feel it my duty not to shrink from this and it is yours my dear girl to obtain the information i require but if i agreed with you in this miss brotherton what are my means of obtaining it beyond your own said martha rousing herself and feeling renewed courage from remembering that there was no proof whatever of the boy's being otherwise than well and happy nay martha returned the heiress gravely amongst those engaged in your father's service you can hardly be at a loss to find some one who must have been employed in removing him and would you have me replied the poor girl indignantly would you have me tamper with my father's servants in order to obtain a knowledge of what it may be his will to keep secret miss brotherton i would rather die than do so i honour your filial feelings martha and grieve to think that you are placed in circumstances which must compel you to make them secondary said mary gently nothing can make them secondary retorted martha warmly i love my father and i hold my duty to him the first and the highest i have to perform on earth save only what you owe to your own soul martha dowling replied mary had you been yourself for nothing in this matter i might think as you do that your duty as a child must prevent your interfering in it though even that i suspect would be but doubtful morality but martha the case is otherwise it was by your influence that this helpless widow was induced to send her child away she did not trust your father but she trusted you do you not know martha that i speak the truth and if i do can you for an instant doubt that your first duty is to redeem the pledge you gave to this poor trusting creature who hazarded all that was dearest to her in life upon your assurance a passionate burst of tears that seemed rather to convulse than relieve the bosom on which they fell was the only answer mary received to her cogent reasonings and so evident was the suffering of the innocent culprit who appeared writhing under the discipline she inflicted that nothing less deeply impressed on her heart than was the remembrance of edward and his mother and the grief that threatened to destroy them both could have given her courage to persevere martha dear martha be reasonable cried mary throwing her arms round her if you knew what i suffered in making you suffer you would pity me but i have no choice left me i am not a free agent martha any more than you are we are both bound in honour honesty christian faith and christian mercy not to let any feeling stop us till we have restored michael armstrong to his mother restore him sobbed martha alas miss brotherton the poor woman herself has prevented the possibility of that do you not know that he is apprenticed let us but know where he is martha and if the situation be one that his mother can reasonably disapprove there can be little doubt but means may be taken to release him teach us but where to find him dearest martha cried mary fervently and we will all pray for blessings on your head i cannot do it replied martha with a sigh that very nearly approached a groan how know you that you cannot martha will you not try to learn this cruel this nefarious secret no i will not miss brotherton replied the unhappy girl with sudden firmness if any wrong has been done to this boy i know that it must rest upon my head so let it the remembrance of it may bring me to the grave and there i shall find mercy and forgiveness but it shall not place me in rebellion to my father 
nor force me to reveal any secrets which it may be his pleasure to keep now let me go miss brotherton i doubt not you have acted according to your sense of duty and so have i in this at least we are equal pray let me go i am not well and greatly wish to be at home mary looked at her with surprise and almost with terror she was as pale as death and shook as she stood up before her as if she had been seized with an ague fit alas martha she exclaimed i have made you very miserable and very ill yet have gained nothing by it you shall go my poor girl you shall go instantly but ere we part let me implore you to examine in silence and alone the question of right and wrong in this case paint to yourself the misery of the wretched mother and remember that yourself i must say it though i wring both our hearts as i do it yourself martha dowling are the cause of it you have said enough miss brotherton to destroy my peace for ever replied the miserable girl but not enough to make me act as a spy upon my father farewell do not let us meet again it is too painful without waiting for an answer martha dowling wrapped her shawl about her and hurried to the door the carriage is not waiting miss dowling said the vexed and disappointed mary who had gained nothing from this painful interview but the conviction that the well-intentioned but erring martha was as much persuaded of the boy's having been unfairly dealt with as herself let me order the carriage for you no no i cannot wait i can walk i know the way indeed i can stay no longer replied martha hurrying on and closing the door of the room after her and before miss brotherton could reopen it she had already passed through the hall and was almost running from the house mary lost not a moment in summoning a servant and ordering the carriage to follow her with all speed an order which was so well obeyed that the unhappy martha was overtaken ere she had walked a mile and gladly did she then avail herself of it for by that time every other painful feeling was merged in the terror of having to explain to her father the cause of her having so parted with miss brotherton as to return unattended and on foot perfect love casteth out fear and perfect fear may perhaps petrify the heart into a sort of unstruggling desperation but a union of the two reduces the mind to a state of slavery the most abject leaving no strength whereby any healthful moral feeling can be sustained martha's whole care on returning home was to satisfy her father that nothing particular had passed in her interview with the heiress and unfortunately for all parties she succeeded miss brotherton meanwhile mounted a little pony phaeton with mrs tremlett and with a heavy heart proceeded to hoxley lane but painful as was her errand her condition was a far happier one than that of martha dowling for in her there was no mixture of motives to paralyze every word and act her kind heart sought and found counsel in her sound and upright judgment and sustained by it she executed her task without shrinking a little reflection on the subject convinced her that it was now become her duty to confess to her poor client not only that her exertions to discover the abode of michael had been unsuccessful but that she began to fear that there must be some unpleasant reason for the difficulties thrown in the way of obtaining the information she had sought it required some courage to utter this but when it was done mary was surprised to perceive that its effect both upon the mother and son was very trifling having candidly stated her fears she remained silent the eyes of both being fixed upon her with a sort of quiet hopelessness that was perhaps more painful to contemplate than more vehement demonstrations of grief our thanks are not the less due to you ma'am said the widow gently and don't vex your kind heart by thinking that we are disappointed edward and i guessed true from almost the first that is from when he was taken off without bidding us good-bye sir matthew is known better by his mill people ma'am than by the great gentry that turns their eyes away from labour and sorrow to revel and grow fat upon our graves you would never be like to hear the truth from them and i am told that even now the country round rings with praises of sir matthew's goodness to michael tis better to hear it but it is god's will our portion should be bitter here he has power to make it up to us hereafter and it is there we must fix our hope most sure and most blessed is that hope replied mary fervently yet it should never check our efforts to put to profit the means of happiness he has granted to us here i have now told you the very worst mrs armstrong for i have told you not only all i know but all i fear nor will i again pledge myself to do more than i am quite sure it is in my power to perform 
i think you will believe me without my talking about it that i shall not give up the search i have undertaken but till some new light reaches us we should but waste our time and wear our spirits by speaking on the subject let us rather think and speak of the welfare of the dear boy that is left you this will be no hindrance to our restoring his brother if it be god's will that we should have the power tell me edward how did you get on at school to-day everybody was kind to me answered the boy that's well dear boy and everybody will be kind to you he looks nicely in his new clothes does he not mrs armstrong he does indeed ma'am and i could almost fancy that he looked better in health already for having left the mill replied the widow and i feel better said edward looking at his mother with his soft thoughtful eyes and i don't think it would be impossible for me to grow well again my boy my boy cried the poor cripple raising herself in her bed and throwing her arms around him should i dare to complain of anything if that were possible but oh teddy wouldn't he have given one of his little hands to see it this appeal which in truth only echoed the thoughts of his own heart overthrew all the courage of edward and his tears again flowed as fast as those of his poor mother a renewal of weakness of which they might have both been still more ashamed than they were had they not perceived that neither miss brotherton nor her old friend had dry eyes mary however was too wise to let this last this dear boy said she has said that which ought to give us all courage i can hardly tell you the delightful feeling which the hope of his restoration to health would give me it would repay me a thousandfold for all the pain i have suffered let us fix our thoughts on this hope and trust me it shall be realized if medical skill and kind treatment can do it it was with this assurance she left them and if any earthly promise could have healed the anguish of the mother's heart it would have been this but her two children were so twined and twisted together in her thoughts that meditating upon her hopes for edward inevitably brought her terrors for michael before her and it was but with a fitful sort of satisfaction that the boy dwelt upon his anticipations of being useful to her or that she listened to him two days after this while miss brotherton and mrs tremlett were pursuing their usual morning occupations in the boudoir a servant announced that a lady and gentleman were in the drawing-room had the announcement been of a gentleman alone mary's thoughts would have instantly suggested mr bell for they had been fixed upon him and the hope of his coming through both the preceding days but the mention of the lady puzzled her nevertheless the gentleman was mr bell and no other and the frank and simple kindness with which he said as he led the lady forward to meet her miss brotherton i wanted my wife to know you too rendered the introduction as agreeable as it was unexpected if you and i my dear young lady said he take to consulting together concerning what we may hope and what we may do in aid of the suffering people by whom we are surrounded we shall do well to take this good little woman into the committee for she has probably more practical knowledge of the subject we were discussing when last we met than any other lady you could meet with equally cordial and sincere was the welcome mary gave to her new friends and if sympathy of feeling and a community of interest on a subject of deep importance to them all could have sufficed to make them happy the long morning they passed together would have been one of great enjoyment but they were all too much in earnest to be called happy while dwelling upon the frightful subject to which their thoughts were turned the longer mary listened to those whose lives were passed in struggling to assuage the misery around them and in battling with the horrid principles which produced it the more deeply did she feel that she too was called upon to labour in the same thorny vineyard yet terrible as were the subjects discussed and sad as was the conviction that no power less mighty than that of the law could redress the evils they deplored there was still something inexpressibly soothing to her feelings in finding herself thus in intimate relation with persons who comprehended and shared in the sentiments which had become so essentially a part of herself though her conscience had told her from the first moment her attention had been called to the subject that it was her duty not to turn away from it she had hitherto met little but opposition from those around her and though steadfast and firm in purpose she had often felt heavy in spirit from knowing herself to be alone when she so much wanted assistance and support this oppressive loneliness she could never suffer from again as long as mr bell and his excellent wife were within her reach and fervently did she bless the courage which had led her to their dwelling tidings of poor michael however there were none mr bell had sought information concerning him wherever he thought it possible to obtain them but he had learnt nothing 
nevertheless he declared himself by no means satisfied that the boy might not be at some one of the bastille-like establishments to which he had applied i know them and they know me too well he said for me to make implicit confidence in any answer they may be pleased to make to any question i may venture to ask if i knew where to find a trustworthy stranger who could not by possibility be recognized by any one as a friend of mine i still think the chances would be greatly in favour of our finding the boy at some of the noted apprenticing establishments which i have named but in truth i know not where to look for such a person am i not such a one cried mary eagerly hardly a creature in the world beyond the town of ashley and its neighbourhood knows me personally and in all such places as those you have named the emperor of all the russias would not be less likely to be recognised but how my dear young lady could you represent yourself with any face of probability as interested in the inquiries you would have to make demanded mr bell methinks mr bell replied mary colouring with her own enthusiasm methinks i could carry through an enterprise which had the recovery of little michael for its object with a degree of diplomatic skill that would surprise you it should not be by downright and direct inquiry that i should proceed where such inquiry would be likely to excite suspicion i would only contrive to insinuate myself and my eyes and would ask no questions save what they should answer many strangers travelling desire to see the factories certainly replied mr bell musingly but you are so young to undertake a wandering expedition and then how could you be accompanied your servants would unquestionably announce you everywhere i am older i think than you suppose replied mary and if i undertake this i will be accompanied by mrs tremlett with whom i have no reserves and by no one else you cannot travel without attendance miss brotherton said the clergyman looking at her kindly but as if doubting that she was quite in earnest do not either of you judge me harshly replied the heiress with great earnestness do not set me down in your own judgments as a hot-headed girl indifferent to the opinions of society and anxious only to follow the whim of the moment did i belong to any one i think i should willingly yield to their guidance but i am alone in the world i have no responsibilities but to god and my own conscience and the only way i know of by which i can make this desolate sort of freedom endurable is by fearlessly and without respect to any prejudices or opinions whatever employing my preposterous wealth in assisting the miserable race from whose labours it has been extracted if you can aid me in doing this you will do me good but you will do me none mr bell by pointing out to me the etiquettes by which the movements of other young ladies are regulated i cannot think that i have any right to a place among them and i therefore feel that to check any possible usefulness by a constant reference to the usages of persons with whom i have little or nothing in common would be putting on very heavy harness neither effective for use nor for ornament but something too much of this i must not talk of myself she added cheerfully let us examine the possibility of my setting off with mrs tremlett on a little home tour without announcing the important event to the neighbourhood or taking any servants with me to enact the part of fame behind my chariot by what conveyance would you propose to travel miss brotherton inquired mr bell still looking as an american would say as if he could not realise the scheme mary meditated for a moment and then replied in the first instance if you and mrs bell will permit it we shall go to your house in the same manner as before only carrying with us a small travelling trunk or so such as would be necessary if we were going to pass a week with you on the following morning we would set off by the blank coach in which you will secure places for us at blank we will order dinner and beds like any other travellers and inquire of the waiter what will be the best way of getting a sight of the factories and he will tell you that such and such factories naming precisely those in which there would not be the slightest chance of finding the boy may be seen by application made to mr so-and-so said mr bell mary coloured and seemed about to answer him but either from consciousness that she had nothing very satisfactory to reply or because she had some notion in her head not sufficiently digested to communicate she changed her purpose and instead of combating an objection which seemed almost fatal drew from her pocket a set of little ivory tablets on which she had written the names of all the establishments within a distance of twenty miles notorious for taking apprentices and of retaining them by means that converted the scene of their labour into a most strict and wretched prison-house she read their names aloud these i think were all you mentioned to me said she i think they were replied mr bell 
but to these believe me you will get no admission as a visitor will you admit me as a visitor if i come to you the day after to-morrow mrs bell said the heiress playfully and apparently wishing to waive any further discussion of her projects most joyfully was the kind and hospitable reply then for the rest we must trust to chance and now if you will let me i will show you my pretty garden said miss brotherton rising and taking from a chair by the open window the ever-ready shawl and parasol which made her lawns and shrubberies essentially a part of her dwelling-place of all the fine things i possess i believe i am only truly thankful for this she continued i hardly know how i should pass my life if i had not a garden the garden was indeed one that spoke of its owner's love by a multitude of enjoyable nooks that seemed all courting her approach and by that perfection of elegant neatness which is never found in an equal degree where the mistress is indifferent respecting it to her new friends praises of all this she listened with pleasure and sketched many pleasant plans for future meetings when they should not as they declared unavoidable now remain only while their horse was resting but mary said not a word more on the subject of her purposed expedition till the very moment of their departure and then it was only to remind them that they would see her come with her friend to claim their promised hospitality on the next day but one this was received with renewed promises of a joyful welcome and so they parted the next day was a busy one for mary in the first place she was closeted for at least two hours after breakfast with mrs tremlett and whatever might be the subject of their conversation it appeared to end satisfactorily for when it was over mary embraced her old friend very cordially saying i feel more grateful much more grateful than i have words to express nurse tremlett and never shall i forget your kindness to me after this they drove to the entrance of hoxley lane and walked thence to pay a farewell visit to mrs armstrong and here it was evident that however wild the projects might be which the heiress had conceived she knew how to be discreetly silent concerning them for after bestowing upon the widow a gratuity sufficient to supply all her wants for a longer time than she purposed to be absent she took leave of her saying you will not see me again mrs armstrong for a week or more i am engaged to go from home for that time but i shall take care that edward shall receive as much attention at the school as if i were at home be sure also that my absence will not make me the less mindful of michael neither at home or abroad shall i cease to employ every means in my power to obtain intelligence concerning him to edward whom she visited at the school she gave the same assurance adding an earnest injunction that he should keep in mind the necessity of exerting himself both for the industrious prosecution of his studies and the not less important regulation of his mind on the subject of his brother's absence the welfare of his mother greatly depending upon both weakness of every kind seemed to vanish before the powerful stimulant thus offered and she left her little protege comforted and invigorated by the belief that he had a great duty to perform and that his mother was the object of it the preparations for her own and her friend's convenience during the journey were very simple but they puzzled her maid considerably first it was so very odd that she should be going out upon a visit and take absolutely no dinner dresses at all with her and secondly it was if possible odder still that she should not take her but mary listened to all the hints and innuendoes to which these feelings gave rise with a sort of gentle indifference which was doubtless very provoking till at length she was induced to damp the curiosity which she feared might prove inconveniently active during her absence by saying i am going to visit the family of a clergyman morgan and as much dress will not be necessary i shall not want you this was perfectly satisfactory a clergyman's family where much dress would not be necessary was where the lady's maid never did nor never could want to go nothing could have been more judicious than these explanatory words they accorded perfectly with the report of the servants who attended the carriage and so completely satisfied the household that though it was the first absence of so long duration that she had made from her home since she became mistress of it it fortunately led to no gossipings whatever we must not pause to describe the pleasant sociable evening passed by our travellers at the house of mr bell nor even to relate all that was said in the course of it concerning the expedition they were about to undertake every instruction every hint which mr bell believed might be useful he gave clearly and succinctly and not a word of it was lost upon mary End of chapter twenty one
Chapter twenty two of the Life and Adventures of Michael Armstrong, the Factory Boy. This is a LibriVox recording. Chapter twenty two Miss Brotherton sets off on her travels and feels frightened at her own temerity, but speedily recovers her courage and plays the heroine. She visits some factories and is introduced to a Sunday school. She approaches the precincts of the Deep Valley. Part one it was about nine o'clock on a bright autumn morning that miss brotherton and her faithful nurse mounted into a lumbering six-and-side vehicle bound for three asterisks their two small trunks with mrs tremlett passenger modestly written on both were safely lodged on the top mr bell gave them a silent blessing and a silent nod the horse-boy vociferated all right and the richest young lady in lancashire rolled off very literally in search of adventures the novelty of her situation and of her sensations of every kind the unceremonious examination bestowed upon her by a smart young clerk who sat opposite the anxious look of mrs tremlett's usually tranquil face and the consciousness that the enterprise she was upon must even by herself be characterized as wildly extravagant if not carried through with much steady courage and discretion altogether produced a feeling of oppression on her heart that very nearly overcame her am i acting rightly in thus exposing myself was the question that her startled nerves suggested and had her conscience been unable to answer it boldly and promptly her condition would have been really pitiable happily however this was not the case there was some feminine timidity about mary brotherton but not an atom of false shame or affectation of any kind yes i am right was the answer recorded on her heart of hearts and shame to me if i shrink at the first step for no better reason than because the dust flies and a vulgar young man stares me in the face from that moment mary recoiled no more and a little resolute meditation on her object and of the strength demanded to obtain it so effectually restored her usual self-possession that she looked round upon her fellow-travellers with as little embarrassment as if she had been used to travel in public all her life nodded to mrs tremlett with an encouraging smile and thought how very silly people were who fancied that everything unusual must of necessity be terrible are you going all the way to three asterisks miss said a good-natured looking woman who sat bodkin between the smart clerk and mrs tremlett yes ma'am i am replied mary civilly the good-natured woman twisted herself round to reconnoitre mrs tremlett your mamma i suppose my dear no ma'am the lady is a friend oh i ask your pardon you are so very much alike made me say it mary bowed mrs tremlett smiled the good-natured looking woman persevered in the same train of pertinent observation sometimes addressed to one passenger and sometimes to another so as to prevent the party from sinking into total silence which might otherwise perhaps have happened but mary bore her share in this trifling annoyance with perfect good humour and when at length they arrived at three asterisks and mrs tremlett asked her in rather piteous accents the moment they were alone together whether she did not feel dreadfully worn out she cheerfully replied not the least in the world my dear friend thank god replied the old woman fervently i know you do so hate to be bothered mary that i was afraid that old fool would put you out of all patience times are altered with me now nurse tremlett replied mary i have left off living for myself and i feel my temper improving already by it now then ring the bell and give your orders remember nurse you are the great lady and must order everything encouraged by this cheerful submission to circumstances which was in truth somewhat more than she expected mrs tremlett began to think that mary might indeed prove capable of carrying through the scheme the first sketch of which had appeared so wild that nothing short of a devotion to her will which knew no bounds could have surmounted her averseness to it my darling child cried the old woman looking at her with equal admiration and delight your mind is as strong as your heart is tender and never will i again oppose my silly ignorance to anything you wish to do it was not difficult in this first stage of their expedition to follow exactly the plan that had been laid down the two ladies professed themselves to be travellers anxious to see all objects of curiosity and particularly the factories which were as they observed so famous throughout all the world the master of the hotel where they lodged exerted himself with the utmost civility to gratify so natural a desire and mrs tremlett and mary were accordingly promenaded on the following morning through one of the largest establishments of the town 
it is probable from the drowsiness of the public mind on the subject that many travelling strangers who are in like manner led by a skilful official through the various floors of a factory retire from the spectacle they present without having any feeling of sympathy excited by the cursory glance they have thrown over the silent unobtrusive little beings one moment of whose unchanging existence they have been permitted to witness it is the vast the beautiful the elaborate machinery by which they were surrounded that called forth all their attention and all their wonder the uniform ceaseless movement sublime in its sturdy strength and unrelenting activity drew every eye and wrapped the observer's mind in boundless admiration of the marvellous power of science no wonder that along every line a score of noiseless children toiled unthought of after the admirable machine strangers do not visit factories to look at them it is a triumphant perfection of british mechanism which they come to see it is of that they speak of that they think of that they boast when they leave the life-consuming process behind them the more delicate and alas living springs by which the great artificer has given movement to the beings made in his own image are not worth a thought the while the scientific speculator sees nothing to excite his intellectual acumen in them he hardly knows that they are there but gazes with enthusiasm and almost reverence on the myriads of whirling spindles amidst which they breathe their groans unheeded and unheard but it was not thus that mary won her way through the whirling hissing world of machinery into which she now entered for the first time in her life the hot and tainted atmosphere seemed to weigh upon her spirits as well as upon her lungs and the weary aspect of the drakes and the failing joints of edward armstrong became fearfully intelligible as she watched the children and she watched nothing else who dragged their attenuated limbs along then it was that mr bell's tremendous statement of the number of suffering beings thus employed came with full force upon her mind she would have given years of existence at that moment could she have believed it false two hundred thousand little creatures created by the abounding mercy of god with faculties for enjoyment so perfect that no poverty short of actual starvation can check their joy so long as innocence and liberty be left them two hundred thousand little creatures for whose freedom from toil during their tender years the awful voice of nature has gone forth to be snatched away living and feeling from the pure air of heaven while the beautiful process is going on by which their delicate fabric gradually strengthens into maturity taken for ever from all with which their maker has surrounded them for the purpose of completing his own noblest work taken and lodged amid stenched and stunning terrifying tumult driven to and fro till their little limbs bend under them hour after hour day after day the repose of a moment to be purchased only by yielding their tender bodies to the fist the heel or the strap of the overlooker all this rushed together upon poor mary's heart and soul and turning deadly pale she seized the arm of her friend to save her from falling terrible hot day roared their conductor in the hideous scream by which some human voices can battle successfully with the din of machinery fortunately they were near the door of the room and mrs tremlett urging her steps forward now brought her to an open window outside it the fresh air so carefully excluded within soon revived her asterisk except in the mills of messrs wood and walker at bradford it is difficult to find any factory properly ventilated free admission of air being injurious to many of the processes carried on in them the colour returned to her lips and having remained silently inhaling the breeze for another minute or two she signified her wish to proceed not now mary pray not now said the frightened mrs tremlett indeed indeed you have not strength for it mary gave her one steady look and the opposition ceased for it said as plainly as look could speak is it thus that i shall find michael armstrong for a moment i felt the heat oppressive said miss brotherton in a voice of very steady composure but i am quite sure the sensation will not return i came to three asterisks on purpose to see the factories my dear friend and indeed you must not disappoint me the young lady's right replied their conductor she'll never see the like of our mills you may depend upon that why all the machinery in the known world put all together won't equal one of our spinning mills there is nothing in creation to compare to it and i don't question but the young lady heard as much before she come so it would be altogether wrong to disappoint her of the sight of em thank you said mary 
are we to go upstairs now yes if you please miss we have got seven stories here and thank god all is busy just now one as the other from the bottom to the top on entering the second room mary felt as she expected that her bodily strength was quite sufficient to sustain her she had not habituated herself to seek the sun upon the upland lawn for nothing few girls so lapped in luxury could boast of equal vigour and activity the first aspect of the system the horrors of which had been so clearly explained to her in action was for a moment overwhelming but it was past the terrible premier pas could not come again and far from shrinking from the task she had imposed upon herself she left the enormous fabric after having perseveringly mounted to its summit with the satisfactory conviction that she should not fail in her enterprise either from want of strength or from want of will good mrs tremlett however still felt less confident upon the subject and no sooner found herself tete-a-tete -tete with her young mistress within the shelter of their drawing-room than she said you will never stand it miss mary feeling about it all as you do the sight of those poor ragged sickly little souls will be the death of you then so let me die dear nurse replied mary if i have not vigour enough both of mind and body to be in some degree useful i should hardly think it worth while to live but i know myself better nurse tremlett i turned sick and giddy i confess on entering that first room but it is my friend mr bell who has to answer for it the impressions received at that moment by my senses served as a specimen of all the horrors he had described to me the account i had heard enabled me at a glance to comprehend the scene before me while that scene itself acted back again as it were upon my memory making me understand a thousand times more clearly than before all the frightful details he had given me the effect of this was overpowering but it cannot return upon me again in the same manner i am already hardened think therefore no more of me dear friend but let us cogitate together upon the likeliest way of turning all such visits to account this cogitation led them both to the conclusion that it might for the sake of appearances be as well to take the landlord's recommendation to another of the establishments usually pointed out to the attention of strangers and then to consult the ivory tablets and venture upon a visit to the only one near three asterisks named therein as notorious for the reception of apprentices in pursuance of this plan the waiter was again interrogated when he attended the ladies at their luncheon and again he brought a written address from his master accompanied by a message intimating that the following morning being sunday the ladies might have the advantage of visiting the sunday school attached to the factory for which he had given the address to a sight of which they would be admitted without difficulty if they would make known their wishes for such admission to the person who would show them the factory there is a sunday school attached to the establishment said mary in an accent of great satisfaction yes miss replied the man messrs robert and joseph tomlins the serious gentleman as owns the factory has built a schoolroom altogether at their own expense and attends their own selves in person every sunday morning to see that both master and children puts the time to profit their factory is about a mile or so out of the town but master says as he can let you have a carriage very reasonable i should wish to go there by all means replied mary desire the carriage may be got ready for us directly the man left the room to obey her thank heaven exclaimed mary as the door closed behind him there is then some christian feeling still left among them here as well as at bradford we shall not here at least be shocked by witnessing such degrading ignorance as that of the poor drakes they are treated like christian children at any rate most surely it is a pleasure to hear of it my dear replied mrs tremlett and it is quite as well mary that we have got to ride to it at least if you feel like me my dear less than half an hour's drive brought the travellers to a large factory which whatever it might be within was on the outside though in itself as grim as coal smoke could make it surrounded by a fine expanse of rural scenery in answer to their application at the gates they were civilly desired to walk in and presently found that the routine of exhibition was precisely similar to that of the morning it struck them both however that if possible the children looked more worn and weary more miserably lean and more frightfully pallid than those they had seen before nevertheless mary failed not when taking leave of their conductor to request the permission to attend the sunday school on the morrow certainly was the reply pronounced in a tone as clearly announcing the speaker's connection with the party self-styled evangelical as the broadest irish brogue does the birthright of the speaker to call himself a son of the emerald isle certainly 
the lord forbid that christian woman should ask to be present at the doings of the godly and be refused on inquiring the hour at which they should be there the man replied as the clock in the tower of the lord's house strikes seven mr joseph tomlins by the blessing of god will begin to speak the exhortation the prayer will follow from the lips of mr robert and then the schooling will begin we must be here then exactly at seven said mary ten minutes earlier would be more decent time replied the man with a gravity of aspect that approached a frown our gentlemen are very strict as to their hours in all things they civilly promised to be very punctual and departed the factory was built on the side of a hill so steep that the back part of it to which the shed used as a schoolroom was attached could not be safely approached by a carriage miss brotherton therefore and her old friend on arriving at the bottom of the hill on the following morning got out and desiring the vehicle to await their return proceeded on foot by the path pointed out to them as the way to master tomlin's school the ladies were more than punctual for it still wanted a quarter to seven they therefore seated themselves on a fallen tree by the roadside and watched the arrival of one or two miserable-looking children who were laggingly approaching the spot you look half asleep my poor child said mary laying her hand on the shoulder of a little girl who ragged pale half washed and with eyes half closed was being dragged onward by an older child a boy apparently about ten years old she be so hard asleep by times said the boy that i can't get her on but why is that my dear surely seven o'clock is not so very early said mary we were all to the mill till five minutes afore twelve said the boy making another effort to pull his sister onward how do you mean to tell me that you were working at midnight demanded mary five minutes afore twelve we stopped cause it was sunday replied the boy come along peggy he added with another stout tug i shall catch it to-morrow from the looker if i so late for the sortation the little girl who had fallen fairly asleep during this short delay being thus roused again stumbled onwards leaving mrs tremlett and mary alike undeceived as to the humanity of instituting a school to be carried on under such regulations they determined however to witness with their own eyes the operation of teaching children to read who were fast asleep and walking on came within sight of the schoolroom door just as mr joseph tomlins showed himself on the step before it with his watch in one hand and a bible in the other wicked and ungrateful children he began is this the way you obey your earthly master who leaves his comfortable bed and his breakfast untouched to lead you to the feet of your heavenly one wicked idle and ungrateful but at this moment miss brotherton and mrs tremlett appeared in sight and in a voice suddenly changed from reprobation into drawling softness he went on come on to him little children i forbid you not but urge you with tender christian love early and late late and early to hear his word and sing his praise here he stopped and bowing to the ladies offered to lead them to a place where they might be well accommodated for the exhortation and the prayer and for hearing the children also if they wished it as soon as they had entered the sort of pew to which mr tomlins led them the twenty or thirty miserable-looking children who were assembled in the room were called upon by a loud word of command to kneel and down they tumbled the elder ones in several instances taking the little creatures already asleep beside them and placing them on the floor as nearly as they could in the attitude commanded the sonorous voice of mr joseph tomlins was then heard pronouncing an exhortation intended to show that obedience to their earthly masters was the only way of saving children from the eternal burning prepared for those who were disobedient in the world to come mary as she looked earnestly round upon every child present greatly doubted if there was one sufficiently awake to listen to this and in her heart she blessed the heaviness which saved them from hearing the mercy of their maker blasphemed a prayer followed this exhortation as little like what a prayer ought to be as was the preparation of the little congregation who listened to it for bearing part in a religious ceremony still mary brotherton waited to the end nor left her station till the nominal business of instruction had proceeded sufficiently to convince her that poor sophy drake's account was strictly true when she said keeping our eyes open sundays wasn't possible because they didn't strap us the children were not strapped and consequently they were with very few exceptions literally fast asleep during the hour and half that this ostentatious form of instruction was going on unwilling to attract more notice than was necessary 
miss brotherton and her companion remained till the drowsy tribe were roused awakened and dismissed by the loud voice of mr joseph tomlins and then they also slipped away regained the carriage that waited for them and returned to three asterisks now then said mary as their one horse dragged them deliberately along now then dear tremlett our search must really begin as soon as we have breakfasted we will set off in this same equipage for blank mill that being the first on my list where apprentices are taken and moreover within a morning's drive of three asterisks and how shall you endeavour to gain admittance my dear demanded her friend as we did yesterday merely stating that we are strangers travelling who are desirous of seeing the factories replied mary but you don't expect to get in my dear do you after all mr bell told you about apprentices exclaimed mrs tremlett probably not was the answer and in that case my dear woman you know what is to happen you are really in earnest then miss mary rejoined her friend in an accent which betrayed some nervousness you really mean to do all you said when we were shut up together most certainly i do replied miss brotherton gravely did you suppose i was jesting nurse tremlett in what i then said to you not jesting miss mary no certainly not jesting only i thought that maybe after a little more thinking about it you might change your mind you do not yet understand me nurse said mary with vexation you do not yet comprehend how determined i am to persevere in the business i have undertaken do not say so dearest miss mary replied the old woman with emotion i do understand you i do know that you will leave no stone unturned to obtain your object and indeed indeed i love you a thousand times better than i ever did and that is just because i do understand you only i did not feel quite sure that you would have courage we shall see nurse tremlett courage i believe often depends more upon the earnestness of the will than the strength of the nerves said mary their attempt to get admittance to the apprentice factory was as they both expected abortive they were told that no persons were admitted there except on business and having nothing such to plead they retreated as they had advanced somewhat fearful lest their having taken so much trouble for nothing might excite the alarming observation it is very odd on the part of their driver or some of his gossips the distance was considerably greater than they had expected and they had little more time on their return to three asterisks than sufficed for securing places in a cross-country coach for the morrow which would convey them to a small town named by mr bell within a morning's drive of which were two establishments known to receive apprentices howsoever and wheresoever they could get them having again booked their places in the name of tremlett prepared their travelling luggage for a further progress and taken a meal that served for dinner and tea in one they went to rest but it was long ere the excited mind of mary permitted her to sleep nor did she in fact close her eyes till after repeated consideration she had decided totally to change the plan of operations she had fixed upon for the morrow mrs tremlett had not yet left her bed when her young mistress appeared at the foot of it on the following morning with her ivory tablets in her hand nurse tremlett she said do you remember which among all the places mentioned here was the one mr bell declared that he considered as the most likely for sir matthew to have selected if his purpose was to keep the abode of michael armstrong unknown dear me my dear miss mary only think of your being up already and me lying abed so was the reply she received never mind that dear nurse it's not getting up time yet only i am restless do you remember the name of the mills mr bell particularly dwelt upon i dare say i might miss mary if i was to hear it spoken again said the old woman sitting up in bed and endeavouring to feel awake now then listen dear soul and stop me when you think i named the right mary then turned to her tablets and read the names with the descriptions of the localities inscribed there it was not till she had reached the last on the list that mrs tremlett again spoke and then she exclaimed promptly that is it mary i am quite sure that is the place i will bet ten to one he said that if sir matthew has been for putting the boy out of sight deep valley mill is where he will have lodged him those were his words miss mary i could quite swear it i was pretty sure of it before nurse tremlett but now no doubt can possibly remain hear me then my dear kind friend and tell me truly if i am right or wrong i settled last night nurse to set off and visit all these factories exactly in the order in which they are here set down but after i went to bed 
it struck me that it would be surely better to begin with the place pointed out by our good friend as the most likely to afford success i like the business quite as little as you do nurse and would gladly shorten it if possible but my dear won't the stage we are going in take us the wrong way a little roundabout but i see no objection in that we have no particular wish you know to have our course traced and this setting off in one direction when our purpose is to take another must go far towards preventing it so that you see we have no immediate change to make and you have only to get up and eat your breakfast in time to be ready for the coach that is to stop for us here god bless your dear heart said the old woman you think ten times more of me than you do of yourself darling little sleep last night mary and getting up before anybody else in the morning is not the way to be quite strong and composed by and by fear nothing i feel perfectly well and greatly pleased by our change of plans i have great faith in this visit to deep valley and long to have the experiment made and over mary brotherton was quite correct in her geography the place to which the coach conveyed them was at about the same distance from deep valley as from three asterisks and without making any further inquiries concerning that mysterious spot which indeed the memoranda received from mr bell rendered quite unnecessary she ordered a chaise on quitting the stage-coach to convey them to the nearest town at which he had stated that it would be likely they should find decent accommodation for the night End of chapter twenty two part one chapter twenty two part two of the life and adventures of michael armstrong the factory boy this is a librivox recording part two of chapter twenty two both the young and the old lady were rather surprised on reaching this place to find every house in it that offered public accommodation so poor and miserable looking as to make them almost afraid to enter their driver however soon drew up to one which upon mrs tremlett's inquiring if it were the best he assured them was not only the best but the only one that ladies could find comfortable here then we will get out said mary courageously and giving her friend an encouraging smile she preceded her into a room that smelt strongly of tobacco smoke ale and gin can we have an upstairs room that might be more open and airy like said mrs tremlett looking anxiously at her young mistress to sleep in demanded the woman who had received them a sitting-room good woman i mean responded the meek-spirited mrs tremlett half frightened by the woman's look and accent what this is not good enough i suppose then you may trudge it is good enough for your betters replied the woman looking most alarmingly sulky had the last been addressed to herself mary brotherton would have thought it one of the duties imposed by her pilgrimage to endure it but as it was she slipped out of the dungeon parlour with great celerity and reached the house door before the postboy had succeeded in his attempts to untie the cord which fastened their trunks behind the chaise apparently hands were scarce at this unpromising hostelry for he was performing the business alone at which mary greatly rejoiced as it enabled her to address him unobserved this does not seem a comfortable house my lad that you have brought us to don't you think we might do better if we tried another it be the best in the town was the reply then could you not drive us a mile or two out of it said mary in a very coaxing voice we should like to sleep at any little country inn by the roadside a great deal better than this and how would my master's horses like it i wonder said the postboy by this time mary's purse was visible in her hand the youth's countenance softened as he gazed upon it and he presently gave an unequivocal symptom of relenting by scratching his head miss brotherton held a half a sovereign between her finger and thumb i will give you this she said beyond the sum you are to receive for the horses if you will drive us to some clean country inn at which we could sleep where is the old lady demanded the boy in something like a whisper i will bring her out this moment said she and without waiting further parley mary flitted back again through the vapour of tobacco and spirits to rescue her old friend a deed of daring that found its reward in the look of gentle satisfaction with which her signal to quit the parlour was obeyed for mrs tremlett was one who could not bandy words and she had therefore endured without intermission or resistance as much insolence as could be compressed into the period of her abode in the apartment why did you not follow me at once dear nurse said mary as soon as the postboy had closed the carriage door upon them bless you my dear i never thought of getting away again till to-morrow morning and i stayed with her to prevent her following you 
how very glad i am we are got away safe and sound from that terrible woman how could you have the courage and cleverness to think of it mary sure enough dear it is you that take care of me and that's a shame isn't it it is but fair nurse that we should divide the labours of the road between us it is you who always take care that we are not starved and it is not too much in return that i should be watchful for your preservation from all the wild cats and tigresses we may chance to encounter the postboy earned his golden gratuity greatly to the contentment of its donor by drawing up at a small but perfectly neat little mansion where milk-pans set on end to dry before the door offered a delightful contrast to all that had been visible at the sign of the three crowns the clean coiffed landlady looked a little surprised at being asked for sleeping-rooms by ladies entitled to so splendid a mode of travelling but the demand being satisfactorily answered they were quickly installed in a parlour smelling of geraniums instead of gin and giving orders for their evening meal to the bustling good woman of the house with an air of old acquaintanceship that looked as if they had been her guests for a month nothing was ever so fortunate as this nurse tremlett said mary as soon as they were left alone our stage-playing as you are pleased to call it must begin here there is no danger that this kind simple-hearted creature should misdoubt a word we say and if you will only perform your allotted part with your usual quiet good sense i have no doubt that we shall reach your heart sufficiently to make her very useful i do not ask you to say anything only look sufficiently interested to support the character i assign you oh dear miss mary exclaimed mrs tremlett colouring is it to begin already the countenance of miss brotherton fell from an expression of great animation into that of deep despondency and disappointment she found that all her difficulties with the old woman were about to be renewed oh why mrs tremlett if you are unequal to this did you not honestly tell me so when i explained my purpose to you before we set out said she with more of severity than she had ever used in addressing her during her whole life before i could then have taken measures to carry on this business without you you know how deeply my heart is in it i did not expect this weakness i thought it was over you are wrong miss mary you are mistaken altogether replied mrs tremlett eagerly i am neither weak nor silly and so you shall see if you won't be so very rash and hasty with me by no means displeased at the energy with which the good woman defended herself mary replied let me see this tremlett and my love and value for you will increase a hundredfold begin then as soon as you like my dear i am quite ready and in saying this the good old woman assumed an aspect as full of confidence and courage as her own in a few minutes their repast which a good dairy made luxurious was before them the landlady remaining in attendance to replenish the teapot and so forth miss brotherton's manners though by no means remarkable to those in her own station for that perfect polish which guards everything without and everything within from disagreeable impressions were always conciliatory and kind to all below her and seldom was she waited upon by any one who would not have gladly retained that office near her so it was with mrs prescott of the king's head the good woman lingered in the room evidently because she liked being there and taking advantage of this mary addressed her venturing to give her the name she had read upon the sign we are in derbyshire are we not mrs prescott yes miss this is derbyshire sure enough what distance is it from hence to deep valley what the factory miss that is called deep valley mill yes how far is it to that factory why it is not over easy to say rightly seeing that there is no direct road to it it is a lonesome out of the way place as ever human beings thought of taking to and i can't say as much as knowed about it by any of the neighbours round there is a cart road i believe as goes right down the mill but the nearest way would be over them hills there of course because the factory is built down amongst the very middlemost of em replied mrs prescott would the walk over the hills be too far for my aunt and me inquired mary oh dear miss i should think so besides tis no place whatever for ladies to go the poor little creatures as bides there bean't no sight for them to look at and besides nobody of any sort is ever let to look at em we must get there somehow or other mrs prescott said mary and i trust in god that we shall not be refused admittance for our business is no common one you have got business at deep valley mill demanded mrs prescott abruptly indeed we have replied mary and by some means or other we must get in and what is more we must see every apprentice they have the woman shook her head 
i have had more than one lodging here for a night said she who for some reason or other was curious to get inside of deep valley mill but i never knowed one of em that ever did more than get a look down upon it from the top of one of them mountainous hills out yonder and it's no easy matter they say to get to the right place even for that for by what folks say them as built the mills seem to think that they could puzzle the wicked one himself to find em out but there's one eye as sees em if no other do these last words were added in a mutter that might or might not be noticed according to the pleasure of the parties within hearing mary did not notice them could you have the kindness to tell us to whom we should apply for permission to go through the factory said she indeed miss i am happy to say i knows nothing about em and if all's true as i've heard said over the ale-pot by the kitchen fire the more people ask for leave the less they are likely to get it but may i make so bold miss as to ask the question why such ladies as you wants to get in there it would only break your hearts and what's more they've been having a horrid fever there and that i know for certain though they sent the poor little creatures off by night to be buried some to one churchyard and some to another to stop people's tongues it bean't no place ladies for you to go when i tell you why we wish to enter there you will not say so replied mary the mill is worked by apprentice children is it not yes miss the more is the pity for that's what makes the poor wretches slaves for life for not many of em by all accounts lives till their time is up hear me then mrs prescott among those miserable apprentices we hope and expect to find a dear child who belongs to us lack a day what a story-book that would make exclaimed mrs prescott how long is it since you lost him it is a long time replied mary evading the question and it is a long story to tell how it happened he is my own brother and this lady who has come with me is our aunt are you quite sure miss that you shall find him there how can i say that mrs prescott when you tell me so many of the children are dead replied mary but so much do i think i shall that i will give five sovereigns to any one who will only put me in the way to get admittance to the mill mrs prescott again shook her head there be a many and a many poor souls around about that would do most anything honest for such a reward but if anybody told you they could do as much they would only deceive you i don't believe there is anybody in the parish not even the parson could make em open their doors to let strangers in do you think that the person who has the power to open them would do it for a hundred pounds demanded miss brotherton i can't take upon me to say miss it sounds like a fortune to me but they are all rich at deep valley as folks say managers overlookers and all so maybe they mayn't think so much of it mrs prescott i would give five hundred pounds rather than not look over the children at deep valley mill the woman stared at her with a very natural mixture of curiosity and astonishment but there was a friendly interest in her eye also it's late to-night ma'am to do anything said she and if you'll be pleased to say nothing to nobody till my husband comes home i don't know but what he may be as likely to think upon what would be the best way to set about it as anybody not that he ever meddles or makes with the people of the mill in any way but he's a good scholar and a quick-witted man too as ever i knowed though i say it as shouldn't this proposal was readily agreed to and the interval till their host's return employed in a ramble of a mile or two along the road where a recent shower had laid the dust while every woodbine in the hedges which skirted it sent forth a delicious perfume the outline of the hills around them though hardly deserving mrs prescott's epithet of mountainous was bold and picturesque and the foreground with its hanging levels and rich copses altogether formed a scene of considerable beauty all this is very pretty my good tremlett said mary offering her arm to her old friend to assist her ascent of a steep hill and i should enjoy it greatly did i not fancy that could we look over yonder hill-tops we should see a hateful roof excluding the sweet breath of evening from the helpless creatures it encloses god grant that you may snatch one of them from it my dear child replied the old woman let that thought comfort you should i succeed cried mary should i indeed carry home that little fellow to his mother and my pretty edward i should certainly feel something approaching to perfect happiness but if i fail how shall i bear to meet them think not of it dear see how that last bit of sunshine comes full upon your face as you talk about it 
that is a sign my dear that you will have your wish it was the last bit of sunshine for the next moment the golden disc was hid behind a ridge of hills yet they walked on for nearly a mile further and when they returned to the king's head they found the good man of the house already returned and his supper as his wife assured them very nearly finished he shall come to you in half a minute ladies if you'll please to be seated while i bring in the candles i have told him all you said to me and he don't seem so much put out about it by much as me but he's uncommon cute as you'll find when you comes to talk to him in about a quarter of an hour mr prescott knocked at the parlour door and being properly introduced to the ladies by his wife was left standing before them while she retreated to pursue her various avocations your wife has told you mr prescott our reason for coming here said miss brotherton glad to escape the repetition of her fictitious tale she has ma'am was the succinct reply and do you think it possible for us to obtain admission to deep valley mill and to go over it in such a manner as to give us an opportunity of seeing all the children if i had heard that much as to your purpose ladies and nothing more i should have said no you could no more get into deep valley factory than into the moon but my missus added something to the back of it as makes a difference this was said with a look and accent which fully justified mrs prescott's assurances of her good man's cuteness i think mr prescott that she said no more than i am willing to make good replied mary i do not wish to expend money wantonly but if less will not serve i am ready to give five hundred pounds to any person who could enable me to see all the children in deep valley mill it is a long sum miss replied the man thoughtfully and i can't but fancy that less might serve the people as is in authority there is bad people i don't scruple to say it and sooner than open their doors for pity towards any christian soul man woman or child they would see em all in the bottomless pit but tis just because they do all the wickedness we hears of that i sees hope they may be bought to break their own laws for if they does one thing for the love of gold they may do another tis plain enough to see to be sure that they knows it is for their interest to keep all eyes off their cruel goings on and what's for their interest they won't easily give up so it may be that squire elgood sharpton himself would turn away from five hundred pounds rather than show off his poor miserable apprentices but that mayn't all good for his agent and i believe in my heart that if we could quietly get to offer woodcomb the manager a hundred pounds he would not have long to wait for a sight of the children and how is this to be done mr prescott said miss brotherton if you can undertake to manage it you may put what price you like on your services i feel certain that you would not name a higher sum than i should be willing to pay why as for me miss i must not be known to meddle or make in the matter squire sharpton would have my license away before i could say jack robinson any advice i can give is at your service and i may be able to put you up perhaps to doing the thing in the likeliest way but as to my going to the mill it won't do one reason is that i never was there before and it's like enough that seeing a stranger they'd set the dogs at me before i had time to say my errand no that won't answer the only man i can think of as would give us a chance is one smith the miller as serves em with oatmeal and pretty stuff tis as i've been told which don't speak over well for his honesty you'll say though tis likely the price is in proportion howsomever whether he be good or bad i don't know another as comes and goes to deep valley as he does and that's what makes me fix upon him as a messenger and when could i see this man demanded mary why betimes to-morrow miss there's no doubt if i goes and gives him notice then do so mr prescott and be assured your trouble shall not be forgotten there is no fear of it miss replied the acute landlord with very honest sincerity and i'll go to the mill outright but i think you'll be pleased to excuse me for speaking my mind that you two ladies must settle between yourselves what you'd be willing to give timothy smith himself for the job seeing that he's not one to work for nothing and another thing i'd make so free as to mention is that you'd do well to make him understand that you don't want to get inside their wicked den but only to see the children one and all of em and then you know miss they may trim em and scour em up a little for shame's sake afore they brings em out miss brotherton after this conversation felt as fully convinced as the good wife herself could desire of the value of the landlord's head and determined to be guided by his advice 
after a little further conversation between them it was settled that she should write a note to mr woodcomb the manager in readiness to give into the hands of mr timothy smith on the following morning if she could prevail upon him to deliver it mr prescott performed his part of the business ably for the portly miller was waiting for the ladies in the parlour when they returned from their early walk miss brotherton possessed a sort of instinctive skill in reading the human countenance which rarely deceived her and it took her not long to discover that the man she had now to deal with was one upon whom it would be folly to waste any arguments which did not affect his own interest she therefore briefly stated the fact that it was of great importance to her to obtain sight of all the apprentices at deep valley mill having great reason to hope that she should find a young relative there for whose release from all engagements she was willing to pay handsomely it is not the custom man to admit visitors at that factory it has been found to hinder the work replied the miller solemnly so i understand sir but hearing that you are in the habit of visiting the mill on business i have taken the liberty to send for you in order to say that if you would undertake to deliver this note to mr woodcomb the manager i would willingly give you five pounds for your trouble that is hardly enough ma'am for the risk of offending so good a customer replied the miller will double that sum induce you to do it for me said mary on what day do you wish it to reach mr woodcomb's hands demanded mr timothy smith endeavouring to retain a doubtful expression of countenance to-day sir as early as possible then ma'am i'll be fair and open with you and not go about to mince the matter or deceive you in any way if you will pay me down twenty pounds in gold or bank of england notes i will consent to give up all the important business i had fixed to do this morning and undertake not only to give your letter to mr woodcomb but to use my influence with him which is greater than you may guess for to make him do what you wish provided that you treat him with the liberality which a gentleman like him has a right to expect miss brotherton drew forth her pocket-book i will give you the twenty pounds you demand mr smith she said in a tone as business-like and decided as his own if you perform my errand successfully i will give you this ten pound note now as payment for conveying the letter and another of the same value when you return to me with the manager's permission to see the children who are apprenticed at the mill mr timothy smith looked at miss brotherton's pocket-book and he looked at her his glance at the first inspired a strong inclination to increase his demands but the miller had studied the human countenance as well as the lady and when he looked at her he felt certain that though young rich and very eager in pursuit of her object she was not a fool and that if he pushed her to a more preposterous payment than he had already proposed she would be likely enough to turn about and look for another agent he therefore demurely replied it is all fair ma'am i agree to the terms and without wasting any further time the man of the mill received the note put on his hat and departed not all mary's self-command and considering all things she had a great deal could enable her to await the return of her costly messenger with composure all that she heard of this mysterious mill tended to prove that it was precisely such a place as sir matthew dowling would be likely to fix upon as the abode of michael the more she meditated the more she became convinced that the boy was there and she was hot and cold pale and red a dozen times in an hour she had kept a copy of her letter to the manager that she might show it to mr bell from whom she hoped to receive absolution for the innocent fraud she had practised to read and re-read this letter and to speculate with mrs tremlett upon its probable and possible effects occupied some portion of the tedious time slowly dragging her steps up and down mrs prescott's little garden and occasionally sitting for a fidgety five minutes in a bower of scarlet runners employed the rest but the morning seemed endless and more than once she suspected that her watch stood still the important letter to mr woodcomb was as follows sir a wealthy and respectable family have recently had reason to believe that a dear child long considered as lost has been sent as an apprentice to mr elgood sharpton's factory at deep valley fully aware that the examination necessary to prove whether this hope be well founded must be attended with considerable trouble to you inasmuch as the children must be brought out from their work for me to see i beg to say that if without giving me further trouble you will permit this i will pay the sum of one hundred pounds for the accommodation should it be refused i must have recourse to other means for the purpose of ascertaining what it is so important for me to know i am sir your obedient servant dorcas tremlett 
it was not till five o'clock in the afternoon by which time mary was fully persuaded that her commission had failed that mr timothy smith in his white hat and well-powdered blue coat was again seen approaching the king's head the heiress who was sitting near the window started up and would certainly have stepped forward to meet him had not mrs tremlett whispered sit down miss mary sit down there's a darling and look like a great lady as you did this morning and that's what you are and always should be mary reseated herself and after a short interval the miller knocked at the parlour door and was desired to enter miss brotherton pointed to a chair and he rested himself the weather is warm ladies said he drawing forth a cotton handkerchief and wiping his head and face and i have not loitered in my errand as you may see by the state i'm in but my horse is getting in years like his master and it's no easy work to drive him by such a road as that i have come by have you succeeded sir said miss brotherton looking as grand as mrs tremlett could desire i am happy to say ma'am he replied with dignity that the second ten pounds is fairly won i rejoice to hear it cried mary brightly colouring and i shall have great pleasure in paying it when sir may i see these children she added pulling out her pocket-book as she spoke here ma'am is mr woodcomb's reply to your note and on the reading of that i look to hear you say that the ten pounds is mine miss brotherton took the dirty epistle offered her and read madam my employer is strict in his orders not to let the hands be interrupted as they too often are in some mills to gratify the idle curiosity of strangers but in consideration of your handsome proposal and hoping that you won't scruple to follow it with a like sum in case of your finding and carrying away the child which will be no more than just seeing that if i part with a hand i must get another in the place of it on this condition i am willing that all the children on the premises shall be placed in the feeding-room for your inspection at twelve o'clock to-morrow i am madam your humble servant james woodcomb the miller kept his eye fixed upon her as she read and the result he looked for followed the perusal of the despatch he had brought miss brotherton handed the letter to her friend and then drew the promised bank-note from her pocket-book the jolly miller rose and received it from her hands i thank you madam said he folding it carefully and i beg to say in return that you would have been troubled to find another man who could have done your errand as well i am quite satisfied sir she replied and will only ask in addition to what you have already done for me that you would be obliging enough to tell me by what conveyance it will be best for us to get to the factory to-morrow mr woodcomb as you probably know has named twelve o'clock i suppose the distance is too great for us to walk quite impossible ma'am altogether out of the question but i shall have no objection to hire out my chay-cart for the day if so be you would think that suitable said the obliging miller i have no doubt it would do perfectly well provided you have a horse that can draw it i should be sorry to lose time in going and should not choose to be later than the hour appointed replied mary i'll look to having a fitting horse ma'am and one as is used to the road and that is what but few are the road is no very good one in parts that's the truth and i'm not over sure that there's another man besides myself that would like to undertake the job but i've no objection to driving you myself ladies provided you think it worth while to pay a tradesman for the loss of his time of course i can't charge my labour like a post-boy if you take means sir to get us to deep valley mill by the hour appointed and drive us back again safely to this house we shall not dispute about the price but remember if you please that the carriage or cart or whatever it is must have accommodation for the child i hope to bring away with me i will take care of that ma'am i will put a little stool in on purpose and i think if i say two guineas ma'am for the job which is no easy one that you can't complain of the price i certainly shall not complain of it said miss brotherton nine o'clock was then fixed as the hour of setting out and mr timothy smith departed mrs prescott's roast chicken and french beans were treated very differently from her previous breakfast and luncheon mary brotherton was in higher spirits than she had enjoyed for many weeks she felt confident of success and for the first time in her life perhaps fully enjoyed the possession of the wealth which gave her such power of surmounting difficulties the kind-hearted mrs tremlett was at length as sanguine and almost as happy as herself and very freely confessed again and again that her dear young lady knew ten times better how to manage things than she did old as she was the evening was again spent in a long late ramble 
and though they did not forget that over a certain towering height pointed out by mrs prescott lay the dismal spot called the deep valley the exceeding happiness which was anticipated for one who dwelt there made them almost forget the misery of the rest End of chapter twenty two